Yeah, thanks and welcome to our talk on offline ranking validation or how we try to predict A-B test results. Um, first, a quick overview of what we are going to talk about today. Um, we will start with a short intro to our company, since maybe not all of you know Otto. Um, then we will talk about what the special things are you have to consider when working in an e-commerce search setting. Um, then we will introduce you to what we did for this offline ranking validation, and we will finish the talk with a short outlook. Um, about us, me and Yunus, we are working in the search team of Otto.de and um, specifically focusing on um, improving the ranking on our web shop. Um, and coming to our company, which is um, Otto, um, and I've brought some key facts about the company. So it's uh, a large online shop that is based in Hamburg in Germany and it was founded already over 70 years ago and managed to transform from then being a catalog retailer to being an online retailer and now we are transforming again to become a marketplace and selling products of many different sellers, not only auto products. Um, today we have a GMV of um, almost 7 billion euros and on average, three million visits on our web page. And as I said, we are currently transforming into becoming a marketplace, which means a lot of growth. And we um, can put that growth into those four categories you can see here. Um, the first one is with becoming a marketplace, you will have an increasing number of sellers on your platform and also an increasing number of products. You can see it in the two graphs. So the first graph um, shows the increasing number of sellers on our platform. We started with around 1,000 sellers in the beginning of last year and now we are already at over 4,000 different vendors. And the same holds for the number of products we have available on our platform. So um, it almost doubled from April last year from around 9 million different product variations up to almost 18 million product variations. The second thing that scales with becoming a marketplace is the number of searches that occur on your web page. So you have much more search queries in total and also an increasing amount of queries in the long tail. So we have around 20 million new queries occurring every six months. And while the search volume increases, we also have a decrease in the quality of the product data we get from the different sellers. So they might not add a lot of um, pictures to their products or the description is not very good, which also influences very much the search performance. Um, and lastly, if you become a marketplace, you have to shift your focus on um, improving the business relevance on your platform for your own products to focusing solely on the customer relevance because you want to be a fair marketplace that treats every seller the same way. So if you, um, if you optimize for customer relevance, you imply business relevance for every seller equally. Um, coming to our product, the search at Auto.de, um, I've brought some a little bit older key facts, but we had in 2020 around 1.7 million search queries per day and on very busy days up to almost 5 million search queries. In total, during the year, we had around 600 million search terms and those were composed of 40 million unique search queries. And um, coming to the topic of our talk, the ranking on Auto.de. So we are in the ranking team and currently the ranking on Auto.de is uh, based on manually curated weighting functions that are defined on different contexts. For example, it can be broad context like fashion or it can be a very precise context like, um, like umbrellas and there are special ranking function functions for each of these. Um, that actually works quite well, so 80% of our customers are really satisfied with our search, but there is always a but. Um, with, the, with the scaling to marketplace, that really doesn't work anymore, so you can't manually tune ranking functions if you, um, if you have over 18 million products that are shown to customers. Also, like I said before, we want to be a fair marketplace and the contexts were defined in the past together with the seller Otto. So if we want to be fair and treat all sellers equally, we should only focus on customer relevance and not say, okay, the sellers can define some ranking functions that we then put into place. Um, and this is why we are trying to develop a model-based ranking 
And um, this is also where the motivation for our talk comes from, because um, we are currently develop developing many different rankers and trying out many different things, and we very frequently ask ourselves the question, so which one is the best approach? Which model should we go for? Which one can we put in a live test? And um, this is why we try to predict what will come out of those tests to have good candidates. And with this question, I hand over to Yunus. Thank you. All right. Uh, so like Andrea mentioned, uh, at Auto.de, we decided we need some sort of machine learning driven ranking system in our shop. But that kind of begs the question out of a number of candidate models, which ones do we put in an A-B test and which ones do we show our customers? And there's kind of two schools of thought when it comes to ranking evaluation. Uh, the first one I'm going to show you right now, which is the ranking evaluation in a full information setting. Um, so full information in this context means we have uh, labeled or annotated data. Usually you would get these labels by showing a group of subject matter experts some queries and corresponding products, and they would judge the relevancy of those products. And once you have those labels, you can calculate any number of information retrieval metrics on those labels, and you can also train your LTR models on that data. Um, the actual way those metrics are calculated is not really that important. All we need to know is we need uh, we know the perfect ordering for our products, and we can then judge how well our ranker would perform. But of course, there's some downsides with this approach. Um, the first one is probably the most obvious one. Manually, manually labeling data is very expensive and time consuming. And especially in an e-commerce context, we observe that those labels might not even be aligned with the user behavior that we see in our shop. Um, on top of that, um, those labels cannot really reflect context-specific information, such as the time of, day, time of the day someone browses our shop, the device they use, or the layout type that we show. Um, also, those labels are static, so especially now where consumer behavior shifts a lot due to economic downturns and crises, we would have to collect those labels very frequently to kind of reflect those shifts. Right. So we thought to ourselves, okay, we need something better. And we turned to the implicit feedback that users leave in our shop. And uh, we wanted to use that implicit feedback to evaluate the performance of our ranking systems. Um, so the implicit feedback uh, can take a lot of forms. There's stuff like the dwell time on product pages, whether a customer ordered the product or not. But for now, we're going to focus on the most simple one, which is, has a customer clicked on a product for a certain query or not? And if we just assume for a second that uh, a click is a perfect representation of relevance, we can actually calculate the same information retrieval metrics that we talked about earlier on our log data. And the way this would work in practice is, uh, for example, we have a query here with uh, four products in a certain order. Uh, two of those were clicked, the product at logging time position one and at logging time position three. So for this very specific query instance, our old ranking system has a sum of relevant ranks of four. Very simple metric. Our new ranker would have switched products A and B around and would have put the clicked product only at position two, which means that uh, the sum of relevant ranks would be five. So for this very specific query instance, it seems like our new ranker would perform worse. And the reason why I'm kind of emphasizing that it's a very specific query instance is because we're kind of changing the granularity. Before we were judging ranking performance on uh, just a query string. Now we can calculate performance on individual query events. And that also means that we can, this allows us to include all this contextual information that we talked about earlier, device type, time of day, etc., in our models and also in our evaluation. And it kind of turns our evaluation into a counterfactual approach, right? Because we ask the question, what if we had shown the user a different, uh, different ranking? Um, there is a big caveat, though, and that, of course, lies in our assumption that clicks are a perfect representation of relevance, because this is obviously not true. Uh, clicks are very noisy, and they are also biased, right? Um, noisy in this context means that users do click on the relevant products. Maybe they are just curious because we showed some weird product, or maybe it's a misclick. But they also very frequently just skip relevant products. Maybe they finished their journey, they didn't even scroll down that far. Who knows? Um, but usually, noise is something that you can get rid of if the data set you use is large enough and you can kind of average it out. Uh, bias, on the other hand, doesn't average out, and uh, clicks are also biased. Um, 
And when we talk about bias in a ranking context, we usually talk about position bias. And the position bias states that products on higher positions are more likely to be viewed, and thus in turn, of course, also way more likely to be clicked. Um, so that in practice means that uh, we don't really have an unbiased estimation of our ranking performance, because our old ranker that we had in, in production at logging time has an influence on our evaluation. And that's exactly what we don't want. Um, so how do we get rid of bias, of position bias? We do it through an approach called inverse propensity scoring. And the core idea is super simple. Um, once you have an estimate of your observation probabilities per position, you just inversely weigh those click events by this probability. So in practice, this means if we observe a click on position 30, we would give this click event just a much higher weight than a click that occurs on position 1. And um, yes, so that also means we kind of reward models that are able to identify relevant products on lower positions. Um, so we tried it out. And what we did was we developed two different models, uh, one based purely on order rates, one based on clicks and order rates. And we also threw a random model in there for sanity checks. And we calculated two different IPS uh, evaluation metrics, the uh, DCG and the sum of relevant ranks. And we used two weeks of logging data to do that. And we can see that for the DCG, there's not a winner, right? So the, it seems like both our models perform more or less equally. The random model, luckily, is the worst one. And, um, but for the sum of relevant ranks, we see that there is a big variance in our, in our metrics, but the click and order model has a slight advantage when it comes to the median of sum of relevant ranks, because in this case, of course, a lower value means uh, a better model. And uh, what we did is also we put those models into an ABC test just to verify that our offline evaluation works. But before we get there, uh, let me just sum up the IPS approach real quick. Um, the IPS approach has a lot, of, uh, a lot of pros, right? It allows us to basically evaluate any ranking system as long as the product base that we evaluate stays the same. And there's also the potential to use IPS scoring directly in the loss functions of your models and thus kind of directly optimizing for those sort of metrics. Um, it's also quite easy to implement, at least the evaluation part. Um, on the downside, though, we can see that the results are not really that conclusive yet for those models. They seem to perform quite similarly. And probably the biggest downside is we really need an accurate estimation of, of observation uh, propensities, right? And we don't really have that right now. The one we have is quite rudimentary. Um, there's also some like practical implications. At lower positions, your observation propensities are very low. So um, just like uh, outlier clicks on very low positions can have a huge impact on your evaluation. That's why you need to cap your uh, propensity propensities at a certain point. Um, but this is only one of the approaches we tried for offline evaluation. And Andrea is now going to introduce the second one. Yeah, thanks, Yunus. Um, yeah, so, so we have this one approach of evaluating how our models will perform in an on-site test. Um, and then we were looking at data from past A-B tests and uh, looked or computed NDCG values between the ranking that was shown to the users and what our new rankers would have ranked. Um, and then we actually saw that if we group by the user interactions, there is a difference in the NDCG values that we get with the models. So we actually saw that if there was no click on our, um, on our web shop, also the NDCG value of the model that we inspected was lower. And if there was a click, the NDCG va value was actually higher. So, um, and the same held for purchases. This is why um, we thought, let's use this information and try to see if we can um, also predict the results from that. So um, we thought that if we look for correlations between our on-site KPIs, like conversion rate and click-through rate, and the NDCG values of our models, um, and we find a correlation, then we can say the higher the correlation between our on-site KPIs and the NDCG of the certain model, the better the model will also perform in an A-B test. 
And um, that's also something we then tested, and we did it also for the models that we currently have in an ABC test. And you can see the results in the two tables. The top one shows the click-through rate, and the bottom one shows the conversion rate. Um, and you can see that also for this approach, the order and click-based ranking is the one with the highest correlation. Um, then comes the order-based, and then the random model has the lowest correlation. And um, you might wonder now why the correlations are so low. I think it's because there is a lot of noise in the data usually, but um, you can also see that the p-value is very low, so actually there is a small correlation, but that one is significant, so um, we think we can still make use of that data. Um, and the prediction for the conversion rate as a target actually held the same results. Not, a, not as much of a difference like for the click, but um, it also saw the order and click-based model in favor. Um, and now I'm going to show you the results of the ABC test that we then did to see if our prediction was correct. Um, and there we see that, okay, yay, for the click-through rate, we actually managed to predict which model will perform best in the on-site test. So you can see that we have over 1% of a better uplift with the click and order model versus the um, solely order-based model. So that's good, but again, there's always a but. Um, for the conversion rate, it actually didn't look so great. So um, what we saw as of now, but the Onyx is, or the, the test is actually still running, so there is not a significant result yet, but currently it looks like for the conversion rate, our prediction is not so good. So actually the order model performed better in the on-site test as of now. Um, that might be due to the fact that we don't have as much data points for the um, order events than we have for the click events, so probably predicting that is even more difficult than predicting what will happen with clicks. Um, to conclude what we found out in our experiments with the prediction of the test results, um, we applied our predictions on data from March and tried to say what will perform better in an ABC test and also we tried it with past models that we had in AB tests and tried to see, okay, the tendency looks right or wrong. And actually, to be honest, it looked good for a couple of them, but some of, some of the predictions actually were also quite off. So um, let's say we are still very confident with the approach and we will definitely put more work into it, but um, we can't tell you we found the, the, um, the perfect solution for predicting the A-B test results that's to come. I guess you have thought so before. <laughs> and um, yeah, so what we can say for sure are the drawbacks of the approaches that we have. They will never work for rankers that are very innovative or put completely new products at the top of the list because if you haven't seen the products for that query in the past, you can never tell if they would have been relevant for a customer or not for that certain query. And um, for the same reasons, this approach also never works for long tail queries. Um, it also doesn't take into account what products are surrounding a certain product. So the relevance, the perceived relevance of a product might change depending on what other products it is shown with in a context. If all the other products are way cheaper, then it's probably not as relevant as if all the other products are way more expensive, then you probably think that's a good one. So, um, yeah, there are certain drawbacks of our approach, but we still think it was worth pursuing um, that idea, and we are also going to continue using it. Um, but Yunus will give you a more detailed outlook on what we are planning to do now, lastly. Right, uh, so we showed you our approaches, so what's next for us? Um, we'll just do, keep doing both, uh, and then long term always uh, double check with our ABC test results and see which one approach which approach beats out the other one in the long run. And specifically for the IPS approach, we have a lot of faith, but we just need a better estimation of our observation probabilities. So we we'll maybe do some tests like perturbations of certain positions uh, just to see how the observations change. And uh, we might also test IPS out for the model training directly or try other approaches in the literature. But the core focus of our team right now is to find a ranking model to stay alive with permanently. Uh, we did manage to beat out the status quo uh, quite significantly uh, on a subset of queries. Uh, but we now want to generalize that uplift on the whole shop. And then hopefully we'll have some news for you next time. 
So uh, that's it. Here are our sources for the IPS approach. Um, thank you for your attention. And we are hiring Otto Sokol companies. So if you're interested, uh, follow the link. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Any questions right now, maybe? Thank you for your talk. Uh, can you go back to the slide about the correlation when you introduced like, the correlation concept with NDCG? Okay. So you say look for correlation between the key uh, KPIs and NDCGs, but what do you use to estimate the relevance to be using the in NDCGs? Aren't you using the like click-through rate or the click order rate you mentioned in the beginning? So um, we, we use the click-through rate and the conversion rate. So we group the data we have by a session of a user and the query term. And then for a certain query and a certain user, we know how large the click-through rate of that user is on a certain query. And that's like the one side of the correlation and the other side is computing the NDCG um, of the ranking that a user saw on our web shop and the ranking we would have shown if we had used the um, our new ranker that we want to estimate. So we so the, the ordering we take is the one the user saw and then we compute the NDCG towards what the model would have predicted. <laughs> I can refine. Uh, but to calculate NDCGs, you need a ground truth, right? So like, how do you associate a query document to a rele an estimated relevance? Mm -hmm. So we, we just say that the order in which it was shown in the shop is the, the most relevant. So the first product gets the highest relevance, and then we just give it a decreasing relevance value. OK. Okay, thank you. And maybe we can also chat after. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I have one question related to the NDCG, because we have done something similar and to try to correlate an offline evaluation with uh, A-B testing. And what we have so seen is basically that precision is giving us more information. So one thing is that have you looked at the precision and, and trying to see actually how does it, uh, if the precision is good, then the detail to search will increase or, or click through rate? And um, yep, that's my first question. I, I didn't really get, we didn't really get that. So yeah. uh, have you- It, it was ha just a little bit too quiet. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> have you also looked at precision and, and not only an indice G and see the correlation between a precision and the click uh, rate? Uh, not yet, right. But uh, I mean, it's for, especially for the IFS approach, it's actually quite simple to include any other metrics. For the second approach, it's a little bit more sophisticated, but mm -hmm. we might try that out, right? Because we also want to know which metrics to train our models on. And then if we then observe that precision outperforms NDCG in terms of correlation, we might do that in the future as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, mine is a very short one. What type of correlation are you showing? I mean, it's like a person's Pearson's or? correlation. Pearson correlation yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Lunchtime. Thank you. <laughs>